thank you so much uh, for being here. And uh, just in case there are any mysteries about our extraordinary panel, we have uh, Mayor Mitch Landrew of New Orleans, Thelma Golden, who's the director of Studio Museum in Harlem, and Jim Fallows, who's the, a national correspondent for uh, the Atlantic. And our topic, as Damien said, is the role of culture in determining, in sustaining, in regenerating the identity of cities. Uh, really, does culture have significant value in large political infrastructure and machinations? Um, as uh, Damien said, the uh, curlicue to this uh, topic, should we care? Spoiler alert, this is the arts track. The answer is yes. Um, but perhaps a different kind of yes uh, we'll get to today than usual, exploring some different whys and hows and even whats. Uh, is there a better definition of culture than one that usually gets tossed around in these kinds of conversations? So uh, let me just quickly give a prompt on the story so far around conversations about the value of culture in cities from uh, my perspective. A uh, lot of these conversations got started in the 60s and 70s precisely because the value of culture was being questioned. Unfortunately, you don't get these kind of questions unless uh, there is doubt. Um, a lot of the question gets manifest in conversations around arts funding. Interestingly, uh, pre-recession localities around the United States, best stats I could find, eight, $858 million. Uh, currently, 2015 number is $840 million. So not catastrophe, about 2% off, except if you take into account inflation. Um, suggesting that, again, on a local level, there is some understanding and value to the extent that dollars uh, speak to that. Another wave of concern really reflected through economic impact studies. A lot of that work getting done in the 1970s, trying to make the case for culture as a form of business that uh, localities should be attentive to. Uh, never something that went over particularly well with the cultural community, because of course those numbers don't capture what uh, artists and arts organizations value most about their work. Um, but also because it's hard to quantify direct impact in this world. Uh, what people spend specifically on cultural events at cultural organizations doesn't begin to capture the larger economic picture. Um, so that's also a source of unease and makes for some complicated policy decisions. Um, some broadening perspectives, uh, turn of the century, particularly as regards to cities. Richard Florida's Rise of the Creative Class, published in uh, 2002, big moment for starting to reframe uh, the conversation about the value of the arts in cities. Uh, but also a uh, hero of mine who's, I think, too little known in the US, a guy named Tim Jones, who runs Artscape in Toronto. Uh, that organization was founded in the mid-1980s. He conceptualized something that he calls the quadruple bottom line for culture. Artistic, economic, social, environmental. Um, he's also the guy who came up with the phrase creative placemaking, which may be familiar to some of you and is something I think will come up as we have our conversation, but it's the notion of doing cultural development uh, specifically with an eye towards community development and enhancement. So I would say the, the latest move in all of this is uh, a sort of marriage of economic theory and urban planning um, and culture. So I don't know if you can have a triple spawn, but um, that's kind of where the conversation seems to be right now. In uh, some uh, parts of the economic universe, a lot of discussion of location-based entertainment or lo location-based attractions. Uh, some of us uh, women are told to have a little black dress, an LBD, an LBE seems to be uh, the wave of the future for many of us in the arts biz. Um, but this bucket seems to start uh, focusing on the category of quality of life. Um, in cities. Uh, increasingly important to think about, um, allows conversations about the importance of parks, of libraries, of public spaces, of urbanism, of historic preservation, um, and really what this is starting to drive towards in the conversation around culture is trying to create social cohesion through the way we construct our cities. So uh, culture, I think, is still struggling to be properly valued. It still ends up in the nice not necessary category, um, often because it's seen as a one-off and not a sector. But hopefully today we'll be making some inroads around the truth of that conversation and if there's a way that we can start moving towards a better, more complex understanding of uh, how the arts really resonate in cities. 
So I'm going to start with a question for Mayor Landrieu, because you've done uh, some extraordinary things, including be a drama major and be a mayor of a major American city. Um, but among them is that you have established an Office of Cultural Economy. And to my knowledge, it's, it's really a first of, best of, most extensive of its kind. So I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the thinking that went into establishing that. I will, thank you. It's great to be with you. I'll, the answer to the question is, is arts valuable? The answer is it's essential. That's the, that's the end, end game. Um, I did, I was, a, I was a professional actor when I was a kid. Um, I was an equity card holding member. I, I attended Catholic University of America, the Harkey Theater Conservatory, where I got a dual degree in theater and political science before Ronald Reagan became president. <laughs> and uh, you know, years later, I found myself um, being the lieutenant governor of the state of Louisiana and the portfolio of the lieutenant governor besides to wait for the governor to you know, become incapacitated, <laughs> was to run the Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Now, my contemporaries in New Orleans, friends of mine, Harry Connick, Wenton Marcellus, um, a whole bunch of folks that left New Orleans and exported their raw talent so that the world could benefit from it um, without anything coming back home. And so very personally for me, when I became Lieutenant Governor, I began to think about all the guys and gals that I grew up with and thinking about ways they could actually stay home and make money, as opposed to exporting that talent. And when I was running for the legislature in 1988, where I served for 16 years, at one of the first house parties I went to, one of the first questions I got was, well, let's just say you get to the legislature and you have $10. You know, would you spend the money on a police officer? Would you spend it on a firefighter? Or would you give it to the museum? Would you spend it on the artist? As though it was a zero-sum game. So connecting those two things over the years, when I got to be um, the, the lieutenant governor, trying just to find a way for, for the guys and the gals that I knew to stay home rather than have to go across the world, I kind of got very political about it and said, if you were going to the appropriations table and asking them to divvy up the budget, the only way they think is I'll spend money on something that's a return on investment. And next to you sitting the guys from oil and gas or the guys from the port or whatever, and I said, you know, you can't go empty. You gotta go with people and you have to come with a good message. So why don't we try to measure what it is that art, music, historic preservation, architecture, what, what is that as a sector? And consequently, it was after hearing Richard Florida talk in New Orleans about the creative class, I thought the creative economy. And I thought culture equals jobs. And if culture equals jobs and there was a return on investment, if we were right, we ought to be able to prove it. So we start, I started something called the Cultural Economy Initiative, and it was precisely designed to talk about the back of the house side. Now, the back of the house side is not getting a ticket to Hamilton and enjoying the show. That's the front of the house side. You bought the ticket, but when you came in, somebody built the building. Like somebody built the $800 million building that Jazz at Lincoln Center is in. Those were a lot of construction jobs. Somebody designed the seats. Somebody designed the scrim. Somebody designed the lights, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody, when, when B. Mike, who's one of our great artists in the backs, you know, decides to apply his art to a canvas, somebody manufactured the canvas, somebody manufactured the brush. So we started to say, what if we could count that? And what if we could figure out how many people actually work in the business? And in Louisiana, after doing this, Scott Hutchinson, who's my cultural commissioner, created this. We broke it down into sectors. And then we, we tried to put some, some macro view on it. We figured out that there were 144,000 people in Louisiana that were somehow connected to fun, food, music, art, entertainment, historic preservation, architecture, and turned them into identifying each other and figured out that they were about 12% of the economy and that they had a 16 to 1 return on investment. So when we identified ourselves, just as you said, as a sector, we began then to push forward on investments that help create the film tax credit, that help create cultural products districts, that help generate capital outlay funding to help reinvigorate some of our major spaces where we do theater, to help rebuild neighborhoods like Aretha Castle, Haley Boulevard that was blown out. And then we tied it into, when my later became mayor, this thing you call place-based development. So that when we started rebuilding neighborhoods, we said, and neighborhood cohesion, it's actually part of this larger resilience initiative. And that's why I say it's essential, because it adds texture, it adds weight, 
and it, it adds an essential component to what people who are moving back to cities are demanding now. And as a consequence, the spin-off economic development is pretty dramatic. And so that's a, that's a 40,000 foot view, and that's the way that we've approached it in the city. And I think that we have some good data that reflects that when you have a major museum or a major theater, or you do a, a major development that has really good design, that the spin-off effect for the private sector investment is pretty dramatic that creates jobs for everybody. So uh, following that up with a, a different perspective, pulling back a little bit, um, Jim is a recent convert. Um, in his uh, wonderful article that appeared in The Atlantic, How America is Putting Itself Back Together, um, he has said the topic on which I have most changed my mind uh, concerns the civic impact of local arts. So if you could just share with us what, what changed your mind and what are some of the things that you've seen locally that uh, have uh, supported that change? And you very mercifully did not read the sentence before that, which began the paragraph, I am a Philistine. That was how I, be, I introduced the We'll section. call you Phyllis, it's okay. <laughs> so uh, so it, it is true, I was, I was talking yesterday with, with Kate, there are two related areas in which both uh, my wife Deb, who's back in the third row there, and I have become converts as we've traveled around the country for the last couple of years. One is simply the role of cities themselves as the locus of excitement. And just the, the 10 second version of that is that we've been, at a time when the national political narrative is so dark, been going to now a couple of dozen cities for a couple of weeks of time just saying, how is Fresno changing its, uh, its circumstances? How is Columbus, Mississippi, how are they changing their circumstances, et cetera? So we become believers in cities. You all are longtime veterans. The other is the very important role of the arts, which I had sort of appreciated as a nicety, to give you one more uh, touch on the Philistine front. I've spent all my working life as a writer, um, but one of my sons, when he was five or six years old at school, they asked, well, what do your parents do? He said, well, my, my, my dad types all day. And that's sort of, that's my, my view of the, of the artistry, of the, of the journalistic world. But, but I thought it of, as a nicety, but I now, we've seen case after case after case of the virtuous cycle in which the arts play a central part. And to me, the, the, the goal of this virtuous cycle is people who say, we really care about this place. And this place can be as bleak as San Bernardino, which is right, I grew up just on, on the, uh, the border there, or Fresno, which has had a lot of troubles, or many parts of Mississippi, or Charleston, West Virginia, or Allentown, PA, or whatever. But you do find all these things which, if they feed each other, you have the, the manufacturing revival with maker movements and things like that. You have libraries, which are crucial parts. You have ways in which uh, there are networks of people trying to recruit uh, young people, but then, crucially to us, you have some sense of, of the artistic component of the identity of a place that is part of, of what makes it go. And I'll just give two or three examples that, that stuck with me. One is Fresno. Who here has been to Fresno? So when I was growing up in Southern California, um, Fresno was like the least glamorous part of California. And people there would not take offense in saying that because a chip on the shoulder is part of Fresno's current identity, of, the, the, of their pride, of saying that we're really coming back. But one of the ways, in addition to having agriculture-related technology, in addition to having the high-speed rail and, and downtown revival, they say that Fresno's next ambition is to become a kind of bohemia for, for Northern California because you can't afford to do anything in the Bay Area anymore. And you come to Fresno and suddenly everything's practically free and you can have this artistic life. And so they have this two week long rogue festival which brings in people from all around the country. So, so Fresno in a hard bitten agricultural town, you know, the role of arts has been important. Um, who here has been to Columbus, Mississippi? It's part of the Golden Triangle of Mississippi with the cities of West Point and Starkville. And that's a place with lots of problems where they've had a, an industrial renaissance we've talked about. But one of the things that struck us as giving the place an identity was, uh, was an arts program based on the Mississippi School for Math and Sciences. Despite it being called Math and Sciences, there's a very powerful liberal arts and, uh, and history component there. And they do these wonderful reenactments. It's a racially very diverse school. And they have people portraying all the slave era in, in, uh, in that part of Mississippi, the, the post-Civil War era. And it's just is, is given the place a sense for all the her heritage of Mississippi, it's given them a way to sense we are in this together. And this is our, our, our shared, um, shared identity. I'll just give one other illustration. Uh, I'll give one and a half. Uh, the, the, the one is, is Allentown, Bethlehem, PA. You know, we all know this as declining steel mills and Allentown is a big downtown <coughs> revival going on. Bethlehem 
They have the old steelworks there, the ruins of the steelworks, famous from Billy Joel and all the rest, which they've turned into a wonderful art center. The ruins are there like Stonehenge almost, and they have all these you know, art museums and everything else uh, there. So that, that's the one example. The half is last week, <coughs> excuse me, last week at this time we were in Dodge City, Kansas, where they have, again, a, a largely, um, <coughs> excuse me, I'll, I'm gonna save the Dodge City point for a moment. <laughs> I, I, I turn the microphone back to you. Great, thank you. Um, so, Thelma, you are in the thick of actually managing a cultural institution in a neighborhood that in some ways has come to represent, long before Brooklyn, Harlem was sort of the cultural dream mm -hmm. of uh, the United States, or, or many parts of it. Um, one of the things that you have said on occasion is that Harlem is going through this massive change now. There's sort of an economic renaissance, which is what everybody has kind of wanted, but the collateral damage from that is, uh, you know, potentially enormous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, culture as a way of managing massive change, but also, you know, the elephant in the room, culture as an avatar for what some people call gentrification, some people call involuntary displacement. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and vision of culture as a value for cities in uh, a way that preserves the value. Right. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think, you know, the privilege of being director of the Studio Museum in Harlem is that we were founded in a moment of this conversation in the late 60s. Right? When the museum was founded in 68, it was at a moment where the necessity was for Harlem to be able to regain right, its sense of equilibrium. It was a way to think about culture as an active partner in the sort of reinvention of the neighborhood. And so that was sort of written into our mission. And so in many ways, to be director of the museum now, in a moment where the community is changing, and as we grapple with the sort of complexity of what this change means, that seeing culture, and more specifically as a cultural institution, being an agent for the ability to create and keep complexity in this process is one of the roles that we can have. So to think about very specifically at the Studio Museum, we think of ourselves as an institution that is both rooted in our past but also looking at the future. And the way to do that in the present is to be as a physical space, a place in which this sort of idea of how people connect can become a way in which these moments of change in the community can get resolved in the space of art, in the space of culture. But it's also a way to be deeply involved in the preservation of the idea of the culture itself. So to have a collection that really represents African American art and artists of African descent, and by extension, Harlem and its identity as a community, right, rooted in black culture, is a way in which we can also stand as something that allows for the idea of change not to be wholesale, right, that the community changes completely. But it is something, Kate, that very much has to be managed day to day, and it means doing this in coalition, doing it in partnership, seeing cultural institutions as real partners in the civic landscape and doing that in ways that often allow us the possibility to be engaged in ways that perhaps many of our peers in the past might have thought not appropriate for a cultural institution. So I think it really brings up a whole notion of how cultural leadership has changed because we have to think about place and not just this idea of place making but the way in which place preservation right, lives within the fiber of our mission and of our work. So I'm assuming one of the forms of leadership you're talking about is working more closely with commercial interests. Uh, at one point you were talking about how the Ace Hotel chain is looking at the Alhambra um, as a development site. So Mayor Landry, one of the remarkable things you've done with your office is combine nonprofit and for-profit culture in the same uh, <laughs> governmental entity. Uh, how, how'd that go for you? Well, well, I would like to say that it was a brilliant strategy that was designed where I knew what the end game was, but that's really not true. What happened is we got beat to death from Katrina and we lost everything. And I, I use this silly analogy that when you show up for kindergarten and your mama made your sandwich for you, you know, but it wasn't the one that you wanted and you wanted maybe something else, you went and found some friends and you kind of split it, you know, or you traded your M&Ms for your potato chips or your Reese's Buttercups or whatever it was. You went and found friends who could help you get what you needed. And in New Orleans, we didn't have enough. There wasn't, nobody had enough to do it all by themselves. And so the model, and it turned out to be prescient and wonderful, but the model that worked was finding friends. 
And so it wasn't just the government, but it was the private sector, the faith-based community, mm -hmm. the not-for-profit community, um, and neighborhood organizations that came together and we were forced by necessity to work together. And when we did that, the other thing that happened is because we were in such agony, we didn't have the freedom to allow the typical walls that existed between us, which we're exhibiting again in this presidential race. All of those things came down. And what we found was that we had common purpose in rebuilding things. So I'll take one, just one space in New Orleans. Ken Swartz is here, who's the dean of Tulane. He'll know this and Phyllis. But a Retha Castle Haley Boulevard. Retha Castle Haley was a great civil rights leader. Um, and this boulevard is named after her. It was, when Harlem was in its heyday, it was the center of African-American businesses. But the 60s came and people were fighting and it burnt out and it was in terrible shape. And we decided after Katrina, a little bit before Katrina, but after we were gonna try to rebuild that. And the center of this is Ashe Cultural Center, which is a cultural institution. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase and some other for-profits were in the area trying to help with housing. So we're thinking about place-based development. Place-based development is building a neighborhood. It's a fancy way for folks that are developers to talk about building a neighborhood. We're talking about a house, a place to shop, a place to get your food, a place to enjoy yourself, a playground for your kids. Otherwise, a neighborhood and a home, a place that you feel comfortable. And we started building back. So there was an old school that actually had caught on fire that looks like any old school, one of the PS's, and the build, and it, and it got burnt, but we actually now have reopened that. We brought preservationists in, architects in, and we've redesigned it as a community market that used to be in the school. It's across the street from an organization that's called, uh, that, that is a theater that has jazz music in it. It's down the street from the Ashe Cultural Center. It's across the street now from something where we actually are working on re-entry programs, and this whole neighborhood has now started to what you said, and you use the essential term, I use it all the time, the virtuous cycle of success, where one thing starts feeding off of the next, and all of these individuals are in, playing in the space that they need to. So, so the for-profits are in it, the not-for-profits are in it, the faith-based community's in it, the community leaders are in it, and now this street is, is, is accelerating back into life, and it is amazing metamorphosis from where it was to where it is today, and it only happened because Everybody thought about it. Everybody opened up space for everybody else, let each other in. New Orleans are kind of parochial. You know, we kind of don't let folks who are not from there come in to our spaces. Well, Katrina forced us to be open. And so we had national players. You guys were involved in it. A lot of folks in here that came from around the country, you know, to help us. We let them in and then we redeveloped that space. And that's just one of maybe 50 examples of how the city of New Orleans has, has again, and we're very similar to Harlem in this sense. We're very, proprietary about our history. We don't want people coming to change us. We want to be more like ourselves, but we want to be a good part of ourselves. And so we are rooted in our past, but we also know that we have a new day coming and we have to prepare for it in a thoughtful way that's inclusive and not exclusive. And that's really the theory that we use to get to the kind of successes that we're seeing in the city at this point. One of the, one of the things that I think you've touched on that's particularly powerful for this conversation and potentially revising it is that you know part part of the combination of nonprofit and for-profit culture was done out of necessity. You said something on a panel yesterday. Uh, I think it was talking in the context of strange bedfellows that this wasn't a kumbaya move. It was because no one element could do it themselves. And what that suggests is there's a lot of polite conversation about aesthetics that goes on when you talk art in cities that doesn't often map to fundamental needs and desires for employment, for jobs, for right. certain kinds of collaborations. At the end of the day, I will say this, and I, and I, I have the street cred to say it to my, my friends because I was, I was an actor. Terrible business people. They're terrible. You say, you gotta eat. I mean, you really, you have to figure out at some point in time how to sustain, there's some great philanthropists in this room who have made some unbelievably generous contributions to art institutions, but it's somebody's gotta pay the light bill at the end of the day, and it's gotta figure out a way to sustain itself. So business models are critically important. Now this creates amongst artists a very natural tension that has been with us from the beginning of time. If I become too commercial, I'm gonna lose my authenticity. You got that whole thing that's been going on. But you really have to think through. So that's why I started talking about the back of the house now, the front of the house side is spectacular. When you go into the Whitney 
or you come to Noma, which is our museum, you want a great front of the house experience. When you go see Hamilton, you want to love it. When you go see Sweeney Todd or whatever, you know, your choice is to go to the Met. And the performances have to be great. But at some point in time, somebody's got to pay the folks that are actually making it all happen. And if it doesn't cash flow at the end of the day, it will not be able to sustain itself over a long time. So I think we have to be very hard-headed about the business models that we put in place. Now, the United States is, is generally terrible about public funding of art. We get beat by most other nations, and that's a big debate that goes on for a long time that perhaps can be a part of the presidential campaign of Congress. But if they can't, if they can't even provide the funding for national security on the streets of America, the chances of them giving more money to the arts is probably not great. So I think we're going to have to figure it out ourselves. But I do think that we have to be hard-headed about trying to find a way to monetize, create sustainable financial models while we make sure that we stay true to the authenticity of what it is that we're trying to do. And I just think that's a constant struggle, as you said, that needs to be cared for or curated every day. Or, or is it in part recognizing that art lives on a continuum from nonprofit to for-profit, and that's, that's a, that, that has not always been appreciated? Jim, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on you know, some, some of the things that you've been seeing in cities that do blur that boundary. I have an actual new thought that's come to me in the last day or two as, as I've been to some of these panels, heard some of these discussions, and thought after a meeting with Kate yesterday about what it is that allows the kind of public-private partnership you've just been discussing in New Orleans and, and New York, too, and that has been so much part of your, your work, Kate. And to me, it has to do with identity, which I would explain this way. Um, I've spent a lot of my working lifetime outside the United States, in China for a long time, in Japan, in Africa, and Southeast Asia. And one of the things that's striking about it is that how powerful the American national identity is. And people can tell American a mile away. Deb and I spent our honeymoon actually on a work camp in Ghana. That's a whole different uh, story. But one of the things we, we noticed is we, among the people we met there, were, there were some other Americans who we came across in Ghana who were black Americans and we were white Americans. And we realized in one second how much more we had in common <laughs> as Americans, the way we carried ourselves, the common references and everything. And what, what's interesting is that when we get to outside the national borders, this unifying identity as Americans just, just blasts out most other nat national uh, identities and people can get together to do things. The Fourth of July celebrations in some foreign land or, or Thanksgiving too are, are wonderful. In our national politics in the United States now, that seems somehow to be unavailable. The idea that we, you know, one political narrative is America is about to fall apart, we're not going to have a country anymore. The other is, well, we have really terrible problems of a different sort. And so it's really, it's become almost impossible, absent an emergency, a war, a challenge, to do something that has, is public-private for the American national identity. However, in New Orleans, in Harlem, in Fresno, in Dodge City, in San Bernardino, in Duluth, or whatever people think, we are of this place. And so it is natural for the local entrepreneur and the young person who's moved there from a big city and the school teachers and the librarians and the mayors and everything else to say, this is in our long-term interest. And 10 years from now, our kids are gonna be doing this and we can see this plan. And I, I think I mentioned my Atlantic article that when I hear national politicians talking about some 20-year vision for something, I think, oh, sure, or good luck. Whereas in, in you're in a city and you say, okay, here's 20 years from now, here's gonna be our river walk, here's gonna be our tech zone, here's gonna be our community. You know, they're working towards that goal. So I think that the, to me, the, the necessary and fortunately available function in a lot of cities, a lot of healthy cities, is a sense of local patriotism that allows people from all the different sectors to say we have some common interest, which happens at the national level, unfortunately, only in wars. And, but so there's a kind of the moral equivalent of war, if you will, at the civic level that's allowing this kind of partnership to go on. Mr. Mayor, I, I want to just put an exclamation point on this and give, you, and give you all a sense of great hope and optimism for America. You know, you, 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 we typically will only see what we look at. Now, I know that sounds really simple to you. But try walking home instead of driving next time or riding your bike. You'll see something that you didn't see, even though you pass by it every day. And what you just spoke of is something that, that, that I can testify to personally. I was in Carmel, Indiana. That was a suburb. And, but they just created this beautiful, incredible art complex. We have in cities across America that are recreating themselves or doing spectacular things. Now, if you're just watching CNN or you're watching Fox, or you're watching MSNBC and your head's only in the presidential race 
and you like the world's going to hell in a handbasket and you only have two choices and you don't like either one of them and oh my god that's a if you can look there if you want but as you look there what's manifesting itself on the streets of america in very special culturally rich ways is that little bitty towns big cities small cities are completely recreating themselves based on innovation entrepreneurship and as most what i would call cultural immersion and there are thousands of examples that would just edify your soul and make you think, you know what? It's really going to be okay. It's really going to be okay because that's where, if you're looking there, it's a little bit harder to see because they're not putting it on TV every day because if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead, right? But I'm telling you that right now, all across America, in all of your states, in many cities and towns, these towns are recreating themselves based on this model and the future, in my opinion, looks really, really rich and really, really bright if we continue to learn from each other. So, so Thelma, can you talk to us a little bit about, though, the rewards of that success? I mean, what it means to have people flocking to your neighborhood mm -hmm. who aren't necessarily from your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about the tour buses, the gospel tours, mm -hmm. et cetera. Is it tourism? Is it voyeurism? Mm -hmm. What price economic success? Yeah. Well, I think what's important about it and why I think another reason why we all think that, you know, culture matters to cities is that when we talk about cities and their transformation, something we also are talking about often is diversity. And the way in which we are able to engage with diversity in a complex way is through culture. That's what we're seeing in these cities. We're seeing dance companies and theater companies and musicians and, and, and actors and museums and visual art spaces that are representing the sort of diversity of culture. So in Harlem, Yes, people are flocking to Harlem. I mean, I love going around the world. You say from New York City, and of course everyone's impressed with that. New York is fantastic. But when I say I'm from Harlem, I immediately am met with a cultural reference. And depending on the age of the person and where they're from, it's so specific across the history of Harlem. So whether it's you know being in the south of France and you know meeting a man who'd come to America after the war to hear the jazz music that he heard black GIs play and wanted to see these bands on the stages of Harlem's dance hall, or you know, for people in the 90s who knew Harlem hip hop or know the dance theater of Harlem. And so I think, yes, Cultural tourism has had an incredible economic impact on Harlem, and it's an impact that we needed. You know, when the Studio Museum uh, acquired its building on 125th Street in 1979, it was with this idea of this sort of idea of economic growth in the neighborhood, and so the tourism allows it. Is it always as sort of complex as we would like it to be? Not always, but actuality is that in the experience of Harlem now, not just in the formality of going to arts institutions, but just the experience of the neighborhood, there is a benefit to what comes from the experience of the culture of Harlem through these engagements. The tour buses on one level, but also those people coming to actually feel and touch and experience through the food, the fun, the music, the art, what Harlem's about. But you've, you've said to me candidly how you feel about the tour buses that don't stop. Right. I Exactly. I do feel, no, I have a complete and total, um, ab absolute, uh, awful feeling about the fact that there is a voyeurism, right, that comes in the kind of tour bus situation where tourists want to see the neighborhood but not feel and touch it. But that has to do not just with culture, but that has to do with also some of the complexities of race and class. And it has to do with the ways in which often people think their experience of that can happen somewhat voyeuristically. And that's something that many of my cultural peers in Harlem are trying to change, right? By actually engaging directly in the kind of conversations that say, get off the bus, come into our institutions, come into our organizations, and have the real experience that comes, not just from the looking at the top of the double-decker, but actually being in the neighborhood itself. So I have one last question for each of you before we open it up to questions. Um, and the, the root of this question is around authenticity and value. Uh, and, and where it starts is Jim was telling me about uh, Dodge City and um, the trail rider statue mm -hmm. that is apparently this very large, I'm, I'm guessing bronze or some, mm -hmm. some similar material that's a portrait of around 10 different folks on a horse. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's apparently at the um, when you enter the city and it's on all kinds of collateral materials, it's become you know, sort of a hood ornament for Dodge City. And it's very important in repositioning what was a slaughterhouse town into something else. Um, I am guessing that uh, for art elites, that would not be considered a good piece of art. Um, you know, something else Jim said to me that I found striking was that, that 
part of his conversion, excuse me for putting words in your mouth, but was moving away from understanding art as a pure thing like a Bellagio and more of an embedded thing um, via you know, conversations around placemaking. So I'm wondering for each of you, is that an opportunity for the arts, this, this notion that you think of it in its protean capacities to inspire, to advance, to become an advertising logo, do you do that at peril of losing sight of quality or can we just finally relax after decades of trying to police the boundaries of professional and amateur and you know high quality, low quality, what the market says, mm -hmm. et cetera. I'm going to start, Thelma, with you. The nonprofit, for profit is the exactly. other dichotomy there. No, of there. course. And I think these are all important questions. And I'm not willing to say at this point that I can answer it in a definitive. What I can say is someone who has worked personally as a curator to create change in the art world and to redefine some of these definitions, high, low, inside, outside, what's considered quality, I think the potential for that is what gives us a richer, broader art world. I think there's still bounds around it that many of us would like to talk about when we begin to then talk about the substance of the art itself, but the possibility that we can think about art and culture, two distinct terms, um, as being important and being important in different ways to different people, I think it's something we have to embrace. It is already happening, so it's a question of how do we begin to understand it and form partnerships that allow for the sort of richness of the different spheres in which culture exists and is important to people in cities to be together. Jim? So, so as you, um, you admirably, uh, you, you presented a better version of what I was trying to say when we talked to there two ago. I've, I've, I've shifted from recognizing art as something you admire, mm -hmm. and that part of high art needs to be admired and savored, to something that lots of people can do as part of their involvement in their local community. And, and uh, one example, a little tiny town of Winters, California, which is uh, it's, it's far enough away from the Bay Area to be still a farming town. They have a plein air festival every spring where they bring in both, both sort of established art artists and normal people to spend a week you know, painting these scenes in, in, in the valley. And in Dodge City, last Friday night, we were in this so-called Final Friday uh, walk where everybody from the town gathers to go from the old Carnegie Library, which is now a historical museum, to the Second Avenue Art Gallery, where they're having a show of paintings by a young farmer. And they were actually, they, they, were, they were really good. But the fact is that it's, it's you know, people who think are showing this off to a restored Santa Fe Depot which is now kind of a historical museum. And so it was part of the identity of the town. They would go to the big city to see a symphony, but there in their little town of Dodge City, they were making the arts part of their involvement in the place. Mr. Mayor? I have a lot of thoughts. A, a couple of things. Um, first of all, technology is going to democratize choice in art, just like it does with everything else. It used to be that the wealthy philanthropists, all the people that dealt in arts, you guys decided what everybody else should like because of the pieces that you bought. You went and searched for the Thornton dial, you know, and you're thinking, well, where's the next Thornton dial? The poorly educated African-American artist from the South who never had an education that might have turned out to be a genius. And in his art, somebody's trash is another man's treasure. That's changing a lot now with education. Now we have things called, the, like in New Orleans, the New Orleans Center for Creative Art, which is a mini Juilliard where young artists um, of diverse backgrounds are, not being are now being trained. And people can guess you know, in a couple of years that that kid's going to be great because I've seen it. Also, because it's more available through different types of technology, you don't have to just go to one specific place to see it. So you can make better choices. And then you can stand up artists and say to yourself, you know, you don't have to die poor. <laughs> and so I think that the kinds of choices people are going to make, I'm always reminded, Stephen Sondheim, as you know, is one of the greats of all time, you know, got really bent out of shape when he was kind of coming up after he had written, you know, the lyrics of West Side Story and was working on company. And they said, you know, we can't hum any of your tunes like we did with the Rogers and Hammerstein stuff. And you got to have hummable tunes. And he said, I'm not interested in having hummable tunes. I'm going to, I'm going to do something different because people were trying to force him into a box that he did not want to go to. And I think that's happening in the, in the visual art world, especially, it's, it's always happened in architecture, Dean. You know, and and I, think that, I think that the world is just getting more open. And the more that we, um, the greater the demand for art, the more experimental people are gonna be, the better choices that are gonna be made, the more we think it's valuable, the more that we're gonna invest in it, the better we train people, the better product that's going to be produced. If we think it's an essential component 
to the very fabric of what it is that we do. So when you build a place, let's for example, so for example, you not only just want the art museum there, you not only just want the theater, every building has to function well, but it should be designed really, really well too. And so when you have design and function mirroring each other, and you have artists that are being trained and they're producing better stuff, everything just gets better. Now, on the issue of, I, want, I really want to just make a little comment about gentrification, because we really get afraid of it. And I say this with great respect. The, 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 the issue of gentrification never comes up if you don't have people that are moving into places. When people are moving out of places, the issue is how are you going to handle blight? That's a completely different problem. I would rather have to deal with the issue of how do you integrate people coming into a neighborhood that weren't there before and make sure, and New York does this as well as anybody, Chicago, Minneapolis does it best, use inclusionary zoning, not just around low income housing, but around arts too, so that you can not over-regulate the market, but also don't allow it to be taken over so that you actually, you, you, diversity becomes a strength rather than a weakness. And I think that, that the relationship between the government and the private sector and actually how you design it can be purposeful and intentional so you just don't let the market just destroy neighborhoods. And I think that's going to be uh, a challenge as well. And then finally, and I, and I told you guys about B. Mike Odoms who's sitting in the back, but, but you know, when you have it, things like um, Art Basel or you have Prospect 3 uh, in New Orleans, it gives a lot of young artists opportunities to be seen by people who are interested in lifting them up. And when that begins to happen, that virtuous cycle begins to take place, and then all of a sudden kids are not stuck in a neighborhood. Now they're edifying the rest of the world based on the genius that maybe you didn't think they had before. And exposing young artists to opportunities, I think, is really one of the most important things that we can do together. So I can't resist. Thelma, what do you wish mayors, with the exception of Mayor Landrieu, knew what do you need me to about know? art that they don't seem to? What do you wish mm -hmm. that you know our national public intellectuals like Jim knew yeah. that they don't mm -hmm. seem to appreciate about what you do? Well, I think it's where we started, that it's not nice, it is completely necessary. And that that necessity is one that has sort of proven itself out over years and generations, but could, proves to be even more important as an agent towards the kind of change that we talk about that we want in our cities and we want in our culture and we want in our world. So why does this continue to be so hard? Jim, how, how, do, how do art people yeah. talk that make it hard to right. listen? <laughs> right. <laughs> I think there is a, I'm somebody who grew up feeling that there were certain areas I was very confident in, the realm of sciences and language, and I had never felt as if I was competent in art. So I don't have good artistic judgment. And I think people. But you know what you like. I know what I like, but so I feel. So why do you feel bad that people tell you you don't know what you're talking about when you say, well, I'd rather listen to, I'd rather listen to musical theater than opera. Why do you feel less erudite? There, there is than still, that like opera? even for somebody as as old and working for as august an institution as I do for the Atlantic, still there's this kind of well, if I make if I say something stupid about opera, I'm going to seem stupid. So I think there is some. I, I feel more. Um, I personally feel more sort of apprehensive in artistic right. judgments. I think it's probably not just me. So there's a way in which the arts have been held hostage by the elite yeah. that you know Amen. Need, right. need, need to be set Amen. free to really right. succeed and get back in the game. Fascinating. And, we, and we've seen many sort of cultural entities and, mm -hmm. and engagements that have, have tried to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what, why hasn't it happened? Well, that's mm -hmm. the work to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think for those of us doing the work, we see that as the real possibility. And, and, but, but we all have to recognize that that's, exactly. that's the job. I think we have some time for can questions. Can I ask one ahead. question? Sure. Let me just ask all the art mm -hmm. experts out there. <laughs> <laughs> if you want. If you want more people to enjoy what you enjoy, why don't you let it be all right for them to like what they like? Why do you try to have to fit them into a box? Like when I go into a, the New Orleans Museum of Art and I'm looking at a painting, and I ask them, well, how much did that thing cost? And they say, well, it costs a lot. And I say, well, how much? And like, a lot. That's like really, that's a Surratt. And I'm like, well, I don't like that. I don't understand that. And, the, and the, instead of saying, well, you don't know what you're talking about, well, maybe I don't. But, but, but I don't like it. If I, if I decide that I don't like opera and I'd rather musical theater or I'd rather rap or I'd rather, you know, instead of ballet, sorry, Damien, you know, rather than tap, right, which was a big deal in Harlem, why isn't that okay? 
And, and I mean, who sets the standard about what, what is really okay? And so it, that's exclusionary. Tim and Thelma do, sorry. Right. So, so, <laughs> so, so just to piggyback one, one sentence more, in the realm of movies, I feel perfectly comfortable telling you, I love this movie, I hate that movie, I don't care if it's a classic or not. Somehow the democratization and courage of judgment that applies to movies that hasn't yet extended to other kinds of fine arts. Right. And it is, it is somewhat of the challenge of sort of working in the world of the arts now that we know we have to sort of open up this conversation. Well, I mean, I'll make a point to you. I think I can prove my point. A lot of years ago when raps first started, probably everybody in here dismissed it as not an appropriate art form, except everybody wants to go see Hamilton. So one, one final thought right? exercise before we open it up. A, a friend and colleague of ours, uh, Laura Zabel, um, first did this thing of saying, you know, who here is a golfer? Lots of people raise their hands. Uh, who here is an artist? Excellent. Uh, who here is a professional artist? So we've got a couple of you. But what's interesting is that everybody's willing to say they're a golfer. They're not Tiger Woods. Um, the professional issue doesn't come into it. With artists, there tends to be a real choke point. I can't say I'm an artist, unless I'm here, um, because I'm not worthy. And, and so that spectrum of amateur to professional, nonprofit, commercial, all of that stuff suggests uh, potential ways of opening up a mental window, at least, that, that may be more valuable to advancing this conversation. I see some looks of consternation, questions. <laughs> we have a microphone over here. Uh, so, not to, great, if you could just stop right there, thank you. And if you could just uh, say who you are. Yes, my name is Suzanne Burroughs and I'm from San Francisco. Um, I, I'm really concerned about the arts in the city of San Francisco. Uh, we've had a huge, um, well you probably are all aware of how uh, the escalation of rents and um, real estate in the city. Um, and we've seen many, many artists having to leave the city because of that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can comment on, I, and I'm sure that's happening in other places, what we can do about that. So the question is rising cost, displacement of yeah. artists and it's, in it's our really cities. And it's really noticeable. Mm -hmm. it's, a pro it's a problem. Yep. So Any thoughts, Jim? Uh, Fresno. <laughs> <laughs> no, and no kidding. Uh -huh. This is part of their master plan. I know that's not a serious answer, but I, but I, you know, big cities need to zone mm -hmm. for this. That's not so, an issue about yeah. art. That's an issue about housing. housing. Yeah, and that's is an issue about making sure that you have inclusionary housing, mm -hmm. so that artists who don't, who generally don't make as much money mm -hmm. as other folks, and the ratio of income to the amount that they pay for a mortgage or rent, for and that's why cities have to be thinking about purposefully, from a zoning perspective, and and an issue of gentrification, how you want to manage. The private market. New York, y'all used to do. You still do rent control mm -hmm. in New York. All right, so they, that's heavy. That's heavy regulation. Other areas, they don't have any. Inclusionary zoning is kind of a middle of the road in between that that you guys have been mm -hmm. experimenting with, and cities have to pay attention to that if they want to keep a good demographic mix of people in the spaces that uh, lots of folks are moving back into, and that's going to be a real challenge going well, one, forward. One thing I can tell you from my days in government, from a policy point of view, deciding who's an artist and who isn't, because most artists work other jobs, is complicated. It doesn't mean you can't address it, but there has to be the political will to acknowledge that that's an issue when you do uh, inclusionary zoning and similar kinds of policy moves. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, somebody over there in the corner? Uh, <clears throat> I'm Anna Palmer from New York, and um, thank you, first of all, for, I find it very encouraging to, to hear your perspective about what's going around, uh, around, in the, around the country. Of course, in New York, we have no shortage of culture, but do you have ideas of funding for school programs around the country where they don't have much access to art, because this seems to be a constant problem? And of course, uh, like, um, Thelma said it's a necessity, and I really think it is. And how can we, how can children be exposed to art if they don't even get it in schools? Right. So you know about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and now we're trying to make it STEAM with putting art in there. When I was Lieutenant Governor, I got the legislature to pass a bill, and actually Mike Huckabee did this in Arkansas, if you can believe it. They said they have to have arts education in every school because the studies reflect that kids that are trained in art, they do better at math. I mean, music is really, and percussion is really nothing but fractions. 
um, they do better at math, they do better at science, and they do better on their test. And art as an integral part, not just as an adjunct, not, it's not the cherry on top of the sundae, it's the banana. I mean, it's, it's like in there, it's an integral part of what we do, is really, really important. And I think that, that as a matter of it's part of the core curriculum, it's essential, and you're going to have to push that politically um, to make sure that it's part of the curriculum going forward. Uh, I think it's, it's an advocacy issue. Two last questions simultaneously so we can get mics to people. Um, Someone in the front row. And uh, gentleman in the back corner, if you could get the mic over there. Hi, Shelley Porges from Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for all your comments. Now, in, light, in line with the title that I saw in my book, How Does Culture Define a City's Food? Can you talk about how the renaissance that you've all been describing that's happening in New Orleans and so many other places, Harlem and elsewhere, um, ref is reflected in the food in your city? And, and does, it, does it lead or does it follow? Stay down. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, okay. no, I can, So hold, hold that and let's hear the other question. Uh, I'm Larry Smith, and I recently moved from New York City to Columbus, Ohio. And that idea of local patriotism is so strong in Columbus, and it's such a city on the rise. And uh, one of the things we talk about in Columbus is the sort of creative bubble. A lot of decisions around art and creativity are made by a small and wonderful group of people. And there's been some micro examples in Columbus to burst that bubble, to open things up in that way to economic and racial and the neighborhoods together. And I'm curious if anyone in your travels or in the cities, um, is there a, a very specific example where you know, the mix really happened that is replicable in other cities? The mix of? Uh, an art project, a community project that brought different ages, races, and communities together. So Thelma, if you want to go for that one, and then yeah. I'm going to ask the two gentlemen to talk well, about food. Yeah. You know, I think we have a lot of examples of that in New York City, and a lot of that comes out of the fact that as a cultural community, we have existed across the five boroughs very much thinking about community and community partnership. So in Harlem, our community partnership structure is not simply an arts one. It's civic and it's educational to this question of arts education, looking at what the community needs and creating those dialogues. But I think what you'll find to your question is that this is also happening organically, because when we talk about arts and culture, we're also talking about the people involved in arts and culture, artists, arts administrator, cultural leaders, who very often are members of the community and creating this sort of idea of the cross-community coalition as a natural part of not just the way they work, but the way they are living in their communities as well. Jim, food? So, so on the food front, I, I meant to include, and if I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Shelley, and, and Shelley's daughter is very much part of this movement in Washington, D.C., the way that food is one of the arts, yeah. you know, that, that lo local food, healthier food, um, also um, drink, you know, craft breweries and craft distilleries are really important economic engines now, and they are connected with it, this food movement, and it also, I just mentioned this little city of Ajo, Arizona, which has a very high Latino and Native American population and big diabetes problems and others of that sort. The local sustainable food movement has been a very important part, both of their, uh, of trying to improve public health and also making it a more attractive tourist place. So yes, I see this as part of the cycle. I'll give you two. Well, first of all, in New Orleans, on the corner of Camp and, and, and Higgins Boulevard, we now have the Southern, Ogden Southern Museum of Art, which is the largest accumulation of Southern art in the world there, across the street from the Contemporary Art Center and across the street from what has turned out to be the singular biggest attraction, which is the World War II Museum, which commemorates the greatest generation. You talk about bringing people together. It's a $350 million beautiful piece of work architecturally. And then, so that, that is a, a, an anchor in New Orleans. And then, I know that y'all may find this crazy, but New Orleans is the only place in the world that would actually have more restaurants after Katrina than before. And <laughs> our chefs are more famous than the mayor. They're more well-liked than anybody else in the city. And they all consider themselves to be artists. If you've, any, if you've seen anything like the something called Baked Alaska, that is a beautiful work of art, and it tastes really, really good, too. So I think the, a great and delicious note to end on, but I, but I do think it gets at part of the, the necessary work ahead, which is uh, figuring out how to appropriately police uh, what gets to be uh, counted as art, who gets to be making it, what the categories are that uh, art and culture consist of, and how they can all be recognized in, in providing the enormous value to cities uh, moving forward. So thanks to this extraordinary panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.